Uh, I'm here with uh, Judith Leso Hurley, um, uh, one of the leading lights in bilingual education from San Jose State University. And Judith, thanks so much for being with us My today. Pleasure. Um, it's great. Uh, it's it's great to have you with us and to, to have this chance to to talk to you. But the first the first thing I want to explore with you a bit is how did you get drawn into this whole world of bilingual education? I mean, where did this where did this journey start for you? Well, it started for me in kindergarten. My parents sent me to a Hebrew day school, and I got out of fifth grade, and I was actually I think fairly proficient in Hebrew, and my I had to take a language in what we then called junior high school. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know what to do, so my father said, well, study Spanish because it's a Native American language and it'll come in handy. He, he was right. Mm -hmm. And so I pursued Spanish um, through college. I have a master's degree in Spanish language and letters from Middlebury. And then I went on to explore teaching school, and I discovered there was a demand for bilingual teachers. Mm -hmm. So I got into a credential program, and from there... I happened to go to Boulder, Colorado for a whole other set of purposes we don't need to explore here. And I met my husband and he was working at the newspaper and he came home one day and he said they are desperate for people who have bilingual classroom experience to do a doctoral program, there's a fellowship. So I went on over to the University of Colorado and they said, come on in. And I began my doctoral work there and did some very interesting work with migrant farmer children and really began to explore bilingual education in ways that I didn't do when I was a classroom teacher. I was mm -hmm. more focused on just what do I do with my kids. Yeah, yeah of course. And that's how I got involved. Wow. And then um, you, you've been watching the, the, the whole movement, I'd say, within the United States toward mm -hmm. bilingual education. There are different kinds of movements or strains within mm -hmm. what we call bilingual education. So can you talk a little bit about the, the national perspective right now? Where are we going as a nation? How much is what we might call bilingual education being, being valued right now in, in the United States? Well, that's an interesting question, Chris. I don't know where we're going as a nation because mm -hmm. uh, schooling is really the province of the states, and that's mm -hmm. a huge push-pull mm -hmm. that we're seeing right now, especially around the Common Core Standards. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started in, in New York as a bilingual classroom teacher, we mm -hmm. had a two-way model. Mm -hmm. But there was legislation, um, first there was a court case, and then there was legislation which required people to start meeting the needs of the kids we call English learners. So the part about teaching English speakers other languages kind of fell away, mm -hmm. which I think was too bad, but there simply weren't the resources to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so some of the big states that have populations of English learners got on board with the idea of what was essentially compensatory bilingual education, just something for the kids who needed English, and that was mm -hmm. Texas, California, Colorado, some of the eastern states like New York, New Jersey, mm -hmm. even Maine. And, but then there was a big turnaround um, about, I want to say, 15 years ago or 12 years ago, and a lot of states started resisting the idea of primary language instruction for kids who don't speak English, and so they went to kind of English only. At that point, and at kind of at the same time, we were looking at the immersion models that were developing in, in Canada, mm -hmm. and that began to catch on, but it, it's very limited in the sense that um, it's not any more expensive to have a bilingual teacher, and it's not any more expensive mm -hmm. to run a program at first. But as we know, even at ISTP, you have to stay in a program a long time, and that's even more challenging in the public sector. Yeah. People move, they commit to the program, but they have to leave for real-world reasons. And so it's hard to sustain a public school classroom unless it has a particular number of students. So yeah. even though, though there are an enormous number of, well, I don't want to say enormous, there's a significant number of immersion programs around the country, they're kind of um, delicate. Yeah. They're, they're fragile. And But I, I am reading recently that people are starting to see, again, that primary language instruction for English learners is beneficial. Mm -hmm. That may come back. There's some political energy for that, certainly in California. And I think um, on the margins, people have really come to understand that getting a second language for English speakers is absolutely valuable, yeah. as we certainly know in this setting. Yeah, no, and one of the things I really most appreciate about ISDP over the last year that I've been here is the fact that we have 
both a French program and a Chinese program mm -hmm. in the same building. And from my perspective, have in a way that the best of Europe and Asia, you know, in, right. in, in the heart of Silicon Valley, sort of the way I like to say it. But so I think it's a very different perspective, as, as you're obviously mm -hmm. you're saying, uh, from many of the other immersion, particularly in the public schools, right. immersion programs that are out there right now. What do you think, um, given you the fact that you've been involved with ISTP for quite a number of years, mm -hmm. you've been on the board in the past, um, what do you think is, is unique about um, our ISDP graduates in terms of the, the skill set that they'll have um, upon graduation? Well, ISTP graduates uh, clearly have the benefit of everything there is about ISTP. They have mm -hmm. very well-prepared teachers. They have a very committed community. They have um, excellent language models. They have small classes. One of the things about any good school, and I think ISTP is an example of a really good school, is that things are thought out. They're not just kind of happenstance. Now, I know there are good immersion programs in the public sector, but the public sector is much more pushed and pulled by external politics, by the fact that I mentioned earlier that people come and go, that teachers are sometimes replaced, and that's not always um, their choice or the administration's choice. And my experience in ISTP is it's just a fine school. And it sets out to do a number of things and does them well. And um, I don't think there's any more that you could say about that than if you go to the eighth grade graduation and see mm -hmm. youngsters who are really proficient in three and even four languages. Yeah. And, and what, so, you know, obviously a lot of immersion programs I find spend a lot, particularly in the public sector, spend an awful lot of time thinking very narrowly about language proficiency as mm -hmm. kind of a benchmark of their program. Right. Um, but are there other kinds of skills and competencies that being in a bilingual program will help students to develop beyond just the language proficiency? Right, well, there's a lot implied by language proficiency. Mm -hmm. um, I, th those folks who attended Ellen Bialystok's talk mm -hmm. heard her talk about the, um, the way having a high level of proficiency in two languages works in terms of cognitive development. Now, going back before her research, we, have re we had research that showed that students who achieve um, high levels of proficiency, we're not mm -hmm. talking about traveler talk in some language or other, but uh, students who go through a, a good bilingual program, not even necessarily immersion, but a good bilingual program that gives them a high level of skills, reading, writing, speaking, and understanding, uh, two languages, do better in school. Mm -hmm. And the way I always thought about that is bilinguals uh, understand that language, that labels are not things, and that things can be manipulated in very interesting ways. So there's a whole level of creativity and problem-solving skills that comes with bilingualism. And then Ellen's research shows that it, um, being bilingual kind of flexes your executive control function muscle. And your executive control function is the cognitive set of skills that allows you to um, multitask, to discriminate and focus on things in noisy, and I mean that generically, noisy mm -hmm. environments. And she also talks about working memory. And obviously, those are all things that are going to help you in school. Mm -hmm. And even in the public school sector, when we look at the way students do when they come through bilingual um, immersion programs, or six or eight years of immersion programs, they outscore comparable kids across mm -hmm. the boards in academics, irrespective of the language that they study those academics in. Mm -hmm. And the interesting piece for me about that is that we're not only those are two-way immersion programs, so they have a full population of English learners who quite frankly generally come from economically underprivileged backgrounds with parents who don't necessarily have advanced schooling, and they do every bit as well as their counterparts who the uh, English speakers learning generally Spanish and sometimes Mandarin. Those are the big languages we see around here. Yeah, okay. So you started out as a student in a bilingual program. Right. You've taught in one, you've right. been a leader nationally in this movement and, and, and researching uh, bilingual education. Um, how you know, your own personal journey, maybe going back to that a little bit, how has being multilingual in your case um, shaped your own life and how do you think it's enhanced maybe your, your experience as, as you've gone through your life and career? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I'm kind of a, like a hyper communicator yeah. um, and I really, I really enjoy people mm -hmm. and it's, it's personally quite thrilling to me to be able to um, connect with people in that way. And 
I, I, you know, I don't think I'm multilingual. I have um, pretty good Spanish. And I, I don't like to tell people this around ISTP because I don't want to like really expose myself. But I have, you know, when I'm in France, I can kind of make my yeah. way through a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. And so people really welcome you. And, yeah. um, you know, the languages are not just labeling systems. They're deep coding systems for the way, for, for the way human beings engage with and understand the world. And to the extent that you can even get a little bit into the language, you get an, an, a window into the way culture, cultures function. And people welcome you into that. And it doesn't take a whole lot of language to get welcomed that way. Yeah. And so I, I found it really, really, I find it really personally enriching. And also, I mean, I learned Spanish. I started, incidentally, in middle school, and so it's obviously possible to become proficient even at a not so young age. And um, and it's, it's kept me employed for many years. Well, that's years, also a good right? thing. That's also a good thing. <laughs> that's also a good thing. You know, I picking up on that point, I feel like. Um, for me personally, when I speak different languages, I feel like I take on a different persona. Oh, absolutely. And I've seen it with kids too. Mm -hmm. I've seen it with a number of kids that um, in English, a, a few kids in our school that are that are very reticent, very shy. Mm -hmm. But when they actually get into Chinese, they're much more articulate and, and, and able to function. And I find that very, very interesting. And um, my wife, I know, finds it particularly interesting that every time I'm speaking Japanese on the phone, I'm also bowing and doing all of these things that, you know, I would never do. Mm -hmm. But somehow when you speak another language, you like you're saying, you sort of take on the persona of, of that culture. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a wonderful window. And I love your, your, your idea that languages are not labels, right. you know, they're not just labels for things in the world. Well, Judith, thank you for spending just a little bit of time with us and sharing pleasure. some personal insights, but also some larger perspectives about these issues. Well, you're more than welcome. It's a pleasure to be associated with ISTQ. Well, thank you very much.